But anyway, welcome to our session today. Uh, we're glad you joined us, our community of cooks. We're glad to do, share with you uh, our love of food and passion for food. We want to hear from you, of course, and feel free to join our chat and ask questions, uh, lobster in general, uh, and other shellfish questions for us. And we're happy to join you, feel comfortable uh, working with us. Uh, in our Learn to Cook format. This is live, so we're happy to take your questions. You type them in, and then they uh, read them to me, or speak uh, them out loud to me, and then I repeat the question back and answer to the best of my ability, right? The chef knows all, right? Like the great Karnak. All right, so anyway, uh, we have a few great things to do besides the lobster tail. We're gonna serve with it white asparagus with some julienne uh, confetti peppers. I'm going to took the peppers, I usually end them, but then cut them into brunoise and the small confetti. So some classic cuts today. Uh, the white asparagus is wonderful this time of year, comes out. Also, we have the broiled shrimp, shrimp cocktail. I'll show you how to do both of those. We're also going to broil the lobster tail, broil the shrimp. And then I have a beautiful couscous uh, with some dried nuts and fruits added to that maybe a touch of pesto for a side grain. And then I have some really fine looking Brussels sprouts, a popular vegetable, no doubt for many of you, will be made more popular after today's recipe and production. You'll see how tasty it is, healthful, but also flavorful. We're gonna saute that. So some nice dishes today and some very exciting items to prepare for any time of year. So having said that, we have our mise en place, which is important. And uh, everything is in this place, a place for everything, everything in this place. A few things, let's chat about the asparagus first because I want to get that tied up. I want to get that simmering so that can be cooking while I get the shrimp and then the lobster tail to be broiled. So the white asparagus, you'll see uh, the difference between white and green asparagus. Of course, the white asparagus, as you may know, covered with dirt so that it doesn't have any photosynthesis, right? So no chlorophyll is produced with interaction with sunlight, so they're covered with dirt. And when they uncover them, there they are, they're, they're white. One thing about the white asparagus is that they have pretty much identical flavor to the green asparagus. The green asparagus is very colorful. This is kind of unique. There's also a purple asparagus out there, and um, they pretty much all taste the same. Now. If you buy very thin asparagus, this is, I guess, thicker than a pencil. The larger the asparagus, usually the little more texture and flavor it has. The very pencil thin asparagus, they cook very quickly. Don't seem to have as much flavor as those jumbo asparagus. They're really great. So having said that, what I like to do is have a section of twine, maybe about a foot of twine. And it depends on how woody they are. So you really can tell, see with the green asparagus, you can tell very easily with the woody part, since it's all white. But I feel the hard part of the asparagus, and I'm just gonna peel a little bit, since it's just a, you know, a, little, a little chewy. And towards the end, I'm gonna find a natural snapping point. So there's the woody section that was uh, the root, attached to the root. You can peel the rest of it, but it doesn't need to be totally peeled, unless, there's a, unless it's tough or you find the skin's very tough. But you can peel them, um, and I do uh, most of them. And then it takes a few moments just to peel down the, the last three quarters down to the stem. They can find this is soft all the way, so there's really no break points. So that's a tender asparagus. Now, also, when you buy the asparagus in the store, and we did an in store visit the other day, it was great at a local uh, produce market. And we noticed that some of the asparagus. Uh, were very moist around the root end, and there's a few, like this one, very dry, so they may nick some of the fresh and the older ones. But uh, the ends, I didn't cut these off, so they actually look nice, they're fresh, same as when you buy artichoke, same when you buy asparagus. Uh, the end is really dark, maybe it's been hanging around a long time. So I peeled most of those earlier, I peeled all of them earlier, and I snapped off the bottom. If they're uneven, you say, well, you know, particular, I like all my asparagus one length, so just line up, line up the asparagus tips so they sit on the plate, peel, and even off the bottoms. That can make life even easier than going through each one snapping off the bottom because then they're different sizes. 
asparagus enthusiasts very particular, right? So it has that great flavor, and uh, you can eat them with a knife and fork. You pick them with a fork many times. Pick them up by your hands and dip them in, in some little uh, yogurt dill if they're room temperature or cold. Or you can put a, a hot butter, if you like, a little lemon juice, a little hot olive oil, balsamic vinegar. The white balsamic vinegar is great. You can use the dark balsamic vinegar too. So I have those lined the way I like. I have my water on. He did it a little earlier, so we wouldn't have to wait for it to boil. I put salted. I put salt in the cold water. I have looks like about a, a quart of water in that pot, and I put a teaspoon of salt, and I salt the water because there's natural sodium in many vegetables, almost all, I would think. And if you have no salt in the water, what happens is the natural sodium in the, in the boiling process, you know, that reverse osmosis, is the water's going in, cooking the cellulose and pulling out some of that natural sodium. So I make sure I put salt in the water so that way, the natural sodium in the vegetable isn't leached out into the water and I have a tasteless vegetable. I'm not putting salt for salt's sake. I'm putting salt because I want the um, surrounding liquid to equalize the sodium in the vegetable. So that's the reason that we do that. That's the reason why I do that. But if you have a salt issue, by all means, don't put salt in the water. So I'm over here at this section now, just for a few moments while I... Water's come to a boil. I have my string. I'm just going to lower them in. My nice bunch of asparagus. I might as well drop two in. I did one earlier. So let's put them both in. Comes to a boil, which, they, which it is. I'm going to let it simmer, which is important. Uh, white asparagus is a little more forgiving when it comes to overcooking the green asparagus, the fronds break off. It's very upsetting and very embarrassing. Same with broccoli. You boil the, the broccoli florets, the little florets will fall off. It doesn't look too good. This happens to all of us. You turn around before you know it, the, the asparagus fronds or the green asparagus are all off and it looks like a, a cooked a pale green stick. So the white asparagus give you a little more, a little more forgiveness, right? A little more time should you forget them. You can also buy that asparagus steamer and put the asparagus standing up and it can steam, which is a wonderful way to cook asparagus, of course, or any vegetable. I prefer, prefer the salt water process. It gives it flavor. That's your choice. Uh, this, you have to tie it up in the steamer. A little easier, just take it out when it's done. Put them in a dish, in a warm dish, in the warming oven, and they're ready. So, in, in this fashion, we have to cook them until tender. I have a knife and a fork to test them. Want them tender and not overly cooked. We don't want them too hard. Things where I send them going to a restaurant, they give you vegetables that look like they passed over hot water. Uh, that's not al dente. That's, you know, it's all hot water and never really cooked in the water. So I like crunchy vegetables when appropriate. Uh, if I want a crunchy vegetable, then that's fine for a crudy tea or vegetable platter, raw vegetable platter. I'm expecting asparagus at a restaurant. I expect it to be cooked, not you know, cooked full and apart, but not hard either. So it's, it's al dente. It's a soft core, and it's the difference between cooking and the cuisine, I guess, right? So I have a nice pot. It has just salted water. That's simmering away. I think it's looking good. I'll let it do its thing while I go to look at our shrimp. So I have, I have some ice water, by the way. I have some ice water handy just to plunge them in there. That's important with white vegetable, uh, but certainly with a green vegetable, just kind of uh, sets the color. They'll continue cooking in cold water. We're going to take those out when they're done, put them in that nice veg dish, and put them in the oven. So same process for green asparagus, same for purple asparagus. So purple asparagus looks great in the store. It kind of pales when it cooks. It doesn't stay the same. So that's sort of like red lentils. Once you cook them, they kind of turn to pale yellow. So that's doing fine. Back over here on the part of the stove, I have a court bouillon. Court bouillon, we call it court bouillon, and that's for my shrimp, for my shrimp cocktail. So what, I, what you want to do is to put a quart of water and a teaspoon of salt, and I have a quart of an onion, I have a 
quarter of a carrot I cut into strips. I have half a celery stalk cut it into strips. I put that into cold water with that salt. And I made a little sachet de piece, a, a spice bag, sachet de piece, pickling spice. The pickling spice usually has a chili pepper. It has a bay leaf in there and it has a little pickling spice. I season my liquid for my shrimp cocktail. So that's, that's brought to a boil and then it's turned off. And I'm just going to taste it. So it's savory, it's flavor, flavorful. It'll give the shrimp cocktail a really nice flavor because I'll cook them in that, I'll take them with the tender, and then I'll shock them also in ice water. So let's take a peek over here now at our shrimp preparation. So here's, here's our shrimp that we have. We're going to um, prepare the shrimp cocktail first, and then we're going to prepare the ones to be on brochette, to be broiled under the broiler. I have the broiler on so that it'll cook nice and on a low temperature. Now with your broiler at home, you have to be very mindful of how high the rack is to your oven broiler. So adjust that, maybe test it with toast first to see how quick it burns things. So it's a surprise to you and your guest if you, you put it in there and all of a sudden it, it got burned. So you can always say it's a Cajun dish if it's blackened and maybe get away with that. Put some Cajun spice on it and say those are blackened shrimp, Cajun style. So I have some shrimp for my shrimp cocktail. These are um, frozen shrimp. They're 1620s, they're headless. I, de I buy them shell on. Um, I don't buy them deveined. I make sure that they are not deveined but headless. And I'll take a pair of scissors and I want to remove the intestinal tract. That's very important. So I'm going to snip along the back with my scissors. See that? And then inside we have those unpleasant trees that we want to take out. And that you remove that, that strip that's there. See that? Goes into the water. There's a few in there from the other shrimp. I'm just checking to make sure any in the back. So this will be for a shrimp cocktail. Shrimp cocktail, I leave the shell on. Some people even cook the shrimp whole with the intestinal tract in. It does come out easier when it's chill and peels off. Um, but um, I like to take it out so it doesn't add any bitterness, uh, which the intestinal tract does have, to my shrimp. So I've done about a dozen of those. I have took my scissors and with my paring knife, just to show the method, I, with my scissors I cut it. I'm checking to see, and I pull out with my paring knife as I'm paring, that paring motion, any unpleasant intestinal tract that may be in there. A little water handy to rinse your hand and to put the little piece in. Now, when we, when we peel these for a shim cocktail, I'm going to do one. Once they're cooked, the corpion came to a boil. I'm going to lower the shrimp in, and I'm going to turn it off. And the residual heat will make the shrimp nice and tender. I don't want a, ru a thick rubber band for a shrimp cocktail. I prefer that. But once the shrimp are cooked, I well, once they peel, and once they've chilled, remove all the shell, including the legs, leaving the last section of the shell on. And the tail, the fan tail, right? Fan tail shrimp. Um, and I'll leave that section on so the guests can then have something to dip into, whatever you're going to make, a chipotle mayo or a traditional cocktail sauce, right? The fresh horseradish, ketchup, lemon juice, which is to shear, salt and pepper. So that way uh, you'll have a great shrimp. Uh, they also sell the shrimp that's already cooked. They're on trays, frozen. So it's just a matter of the time and convenience that you have. Tastes nice. They say, wow, those shrimp are great. Where did you buy them? You say, I made them. So let's take a peek over here at, the, uh, at, our, at our stove. I'm going to turn the asparagus off. They're looking awfully good. There's my corps bouillon, right? My poaching liquid, as we say. Corps de bouillon, classic poaching liquid. We can do that. We do that with salmon. Many times we'll poach fish. You want to poach chicken breasts. You want to poach some salmon or a halibut. You don't want to broil it or grill it or saute it. So a little healthier. 
So they came to a boil, that nice crow bouillon, right? The mirepoix, onions, carrots, celery, and a pickling spice. Or the pickling spice can be, if you don't want, don't want to use pickling spice, maybe you want to use uh, some lemon slices, at least some salt, and just vegetables, that's fine. Sometimes you can put celery seed or other uh, aromatics. Depends on the flavor you want. Sometimes fennel seed gives it a little exotic taste. You can experiment with that. I use pickling spice because it's easily available. So the copion came to a boil. I'm going to take out my sachet de piece because it's in a little spice bag. Remove that. I'm going to lower my shrimp in. Give them a little stir. And I'm going to bring that to a boil. Then I'm going to turn it off because I really would like them to be nice and tender. So let's take a peek at the asparagus. It's looking very nice. Now these shrimp, you know, they cook so quickly, before you know it, they'll be done. So I'm going to wash them two things at one time, right? Let's see our asparagus. Nice and tender, but firm, right? So you say, well, what is that? How do you decide that? Very nice. Pierces very easily. See that? Well, it's done. Now, white asparagus, you can actually keep it water a little longer. Even put a drop of vinegar if you want, because that's good for white vegetables like uh, cauliflower and, um, and white asparagus, and cover it with just a little water. But the vinegar will intensify the white color. As you may have seen, our beet video we did, um, the beets video we did, um, I think it came up yesterday. The, uh, that's, the shrimp come to a boil, let me turn it off. The, the beet video, we put vinegar in the beet water. You cook red vegetables covered, red cabbage and beets. It intensifies the color, the vinegar. So you can put some vinegar, if you like, in the water as the asparagus stay in a little warm water. So there's the string. It's looking awfully nice. And then uh, I'm going to just put maybe just a little broth if I want or butter on that. Just a little broth because I'm going to put it in my warming drawer and put a little saran wrap on the top so it stays nice and warm. Then I'm going to saute my garnishes. So a little saran wrap. So that can, saran wrap certainly is, is used in the oven and in a warming drawer, saran wrap. It'll cling nice and you can use foil but many times I have trouble figuring out what's all those five or six items in my oven, I can't see through it. So you can even cook in saran wrap. At some point in the future, we'll make a seafood sausage in saran wrap and foil. So there's my white asparagus. They're very happy. Put them inside. Let's take a look at the shrimps while we're here. If you have any questions, we're happy to take your questions. So the shrimp sitting there. They're done already. They're firm to the touch. I'll take them out, and then I'll have you take a look at them. Where do they sit there? Maybe five, six minutes? But the, since the asparagus was white and they're tender, um, there was no need to set the color, so I did not put the asparagus in ice water. Um, there's been some debate that uh, ice doesn't stop the cooking process. I guess it will cool the vegetable off quickly. But since it's white and I, I'm going to serve it soon, I'm going to keep it warm in the oven. So I did not shock it. Now, if I go to serve it for later on, I wanted to reheat it, definitely in ice water to stop the cooking process and drain it. You don't want to store anything in ice. For a good reason, the same thing for these shrimp. They're nice and tender. So we just stopped the cooking process. I'm going to take them out of the ice now because I want them to... Um, Want them to be flavor, flavorful for my guests. So we don't boil the shrimp. You know, so if I say I'm going to boil the shrimp or you have a shrimp ball as we do in New Orleans, that's okay. You do a crayfish boil, they hold it better. Um, mostly the boil it refers to the process or the, the uh, seasoning. There is a number of crayfish or shrimp boils you can buy, and that'd be nice to add to the hot water as well, right? So there's Cacheres, and there's um, Y River, and there's the old standby, 
the one that they used in the Baltimore area. Old Bay, I think it is. So these shrimps, let's, let's see one. So now you peel them. They even look different than the ones that um, tend to be rubberized. So it's a beautiful looking shrimp. Are there any spots anywhere? Take them out. So ready to eat. It really smells like shrimp. I mean, that's what's so nice. It has a nice aroma to it. And we'll, we'll keep those chilled, uh, serve them on ice, and with a, um, with a beautiful cocktail sauce. So that's how to cook shrimp. So I'm going to put those aside. Uh, why did I peel those shrimp? Why didn't you? Oh, uh, we didn't. The question was, why didn't I peel the shrimp before I cooked them? Because the shell um, will give it, um, retain some of the flavor. And uh, we cooked them in the shell for that reason. And that is my belief and the belief of many folks that if you cook them in the shell, they won't overcook, number one and that uh, they'll keep their shape, they won't curl so much into this little tiny little <laughs> curled up shrimp, you see that sometimes. And those are the reasons. And, uh, and for a little flavor from the shell, uh, many folks will also save the, the raw shrimp. So I'm, uh, the raw shrimp shell, shells, freeze the raw shrimp shells from a raw shrimp for broiling and keep that for a uh, shrimp bisque or a, a, a shrimp broth, right? Or a shrimp butter. So. Now I'm making the uh, brochette shrimp, and I've shelled those because in, in Western culture, we don't usually serve the shrimp with the shell on, unless it's a crab boil, I guess, or a crawfish or crawdad boil, or a crab boil, right? Uh, if you go to Southeast Asia, other countries, they'll broil the shrimp, cook the shrimp with the shell on because even with the head on, there's a little sweet flavor from the head and the carapace and the central body. Um, but for our guests, you know, it's, it's very messy if you're going to put garlic butter, which we are, to have these in the shell. So cooking shrimp in the shell for a cocktail, definitely. And you can avoid that taking out the intestinal tract if you want to. Uh, and it actually comes out very easy after. Like I said, some of that bitterness might remain, and uh, I want to avoid that. So I took the shell. I've saved these shells. I'll freeze the shells. Now, I did the same thing. I had my scissors snipped at the back, removed the intestinal tract, so nice and clean looking to look it over. I use a double skewer because, well, they keep the, kind of the shrimp in one place. Six per person, right? You're going to serve a side dish. Um, so um, you can marinate that if you want, a little oil and vinegar. Uh, a little mint shallots. But remember, whatever you put, whatever you marinate will tend to burn on the broiler. So if it's just a little oil, or just a little white wine, um, it's just best to get the, a beautiful shrimp. When you buy the shrimp in the bag, make sure the bag always has a visible window. There isn't too much snow in there or, or other ice. It shows it's been frozen twice. So when I uh, buy shrimp, I look in the back of the frozen shrimp bag and there's always a small window, and they know people take a look in there and say, oh, there's lots of snow and ice in there. That means they've been defrosted, refrozen, and the liquid uh, exuded out and refroze again. So I'm going to make sure they're, they're IQF, individually quick frozen. You don't want them peeled and deveined, but they sell them peeled and deveined already cooked too. So again, it's your choice. You want to buy them peeled and deveined, quick frozen, PD, call them IQF PDQ, already cooked, defrost them. Um, Put, around, uh, put them around uh, some ice and cocktail sauce. Sometimes it tastes kind of watery. Huh? So you'll find the texture is really nice to make your own shrimp cocktail. And of course, we'll have the recipe up as soon as possible. So I'm ready to broil my sh shrimp on brochette on a skewer. A little broiler pan. I've got a smaller broiler pan. I have my broiler on on the other side of the kitchen. I have to walk over there. But I'm going to brush it first with some melted butter. So that gives it a little color on one side. I, I give a little space. Uh, some folks may say, well, I like to put mushrooms in there or cherry tomatoes. Well, 
uh, mushrooms and cherry tomatoes tend to fall off, so if you say, well, I want to put some uh, cherry tomatoes on at the end, put them on at the end for decoration, have the uh, mushroom already cooked, a mushroom quarter, put them on because they usually break off. So there's a nice uh, brochette. We have to salt it, right? Don't forget, you want to salt proteins first so that they're absorbed into, you know, the tissue or the product itself. You salt it after, it's going to bounce off and have salty tasting shrimp. So this way, it's moist now, it's still a little wet, I melted butter, some salt. You can put pepper, but pepper tends to burn as well, so I put the pepper after. And put that in the broth and come back and make the accompanying veg or starch for that, which is a great couscous. So I'm just walking around the side. This is give you a chance to come up with some more questions if you have to ask. No questions. All right, so we're doing good then, right? We've ans answered all your questions, or well, the ones that at least pertain to this, right? So I'm going to put my butter. It congealed already, so I'm going to put some of my butter back into uh, my little pot of butter on the stove. Now I'm going to put together some couscous and get that going. What I have is a teaspoon of softened butter. I have a cup of veg stock or water, either or. I'm going to bring that to a boil. I measured out a cup of couscous. It happens to be sun-dried tomato and basil couscous. This is not the instant one. This is the one that cooks in five minutes. So couscous sounds very exotic. This is the smallest couscous. This is like the Moroccan couscous, really tiny. It's made from wheat. So if you're a celiac, you're not going to be consuming that. Uh, it's a grain. It can be used as a, a side dish, a side grain. You know what you call it a starch, but it's certainly a grain. It's wheat that's been crushed and cracked and steamed. Um, and then the more they steam and add more uh, wheat to it, the larger it gets. So this is the smallest, is the Moroccan couscous. And the next one would be the, the pearl couscous. And you're going to see the Israeli couscous. And the Lebanese, like the size of a pea. So they're really great. So I love all those couscous. So it came to a boil. I'm going to just give it a stir. I'm going to turn the heat off. We'll burn the kitchen down, that big flame. And then I'm going to add some, uh, a little pepper in there. I like a little pepper in my couscous. The stock wasn't, as, uh, wasn't salty. It was a veg stock, and your stock shouldn't be salty. You can certainly can use instant, use instant, um, in, uh, the, the, uh, the soup bases. I'm going to cover it. I've turned it off. I'm going to cover it in five minutes. That's how easy it is to make couscous. You can put a plethora of ingredients in it. What I'm going to do today is add some, uh, some nice cranberries, have some toasted almonds, have chopped figs, and I even have some drop, uh, diced apricot. Why not? It's very festive looking, very colorful, healthful. You can uh, omit the butter, just use the stock or just water. Omit the salt, you can use olive oil. So your choice. So, and it's a dish used throughout the northern Africa and the Mediterranean. In Sicily, they make a seafood couscous. In North Africa, they add lamb to it. So let's take a look at the shrimp and come back and look at the lobster tails. The shrimp are doing fine. It's going to turn them over a little bit. They look very happy in there. All right, so we have that. Let's now take a look at, as we did the shrimp cocktail, and we have the, the shrimp on brochette, the grilled camarones, the grilled shrimp. Now I'm going to bring up our lobster tail, right? So here's a tail of a lobster. Well, shrimp's doing good. Remind myself not to forget about the shrimp. Lobster tail is here. And here's his cousin. Oh, it's alive. <clears throat> He's alive. Uh, it's my pet lobster. I brought him in today. I've been fattening him up because they're going to cook him up. Um, these are two different lobsters. I have rubber bands on him because he tends to bite. I know how he is. Not very friendly. Especially he knows what's going to happen, right? So there's your lobster. If you're going to buy a whole lobster, he should, or she, it's the she, the summerettes are thin, thinner. The summerettes are larger when it's male. The summerettes are thinner when they're female. It might have roe in it. Uh, lobsters travel very well. 
He was wrapped in, uh, is from, this is from New England, the North Atlantic. These are the lobster tails. They do not come from the Maine or North Atlantic lobster. These are warm water spiny lobster. The, the body and the head and the, it doesn't have any, it doesn't have the masher and the pincer like the Omaris Americanus, which is the lobster from Labrador through North Carolina. This is warm water, a little different color of the shell as well. The, the body doesn't have any, uh, it doesn't have anything in it and it, it deteriorates. They always cut off the, uh, the, I guess that's the carapace and the spines and those are discarded. Though in Southeast Asia and in the Southern Hemisphere, the whole spine lobster is sold, but it, doesn't, it has lots of small, small uh, swimmeret claws, but no large claws. And those you'll see used for sashimi in Asia. Um, they're sold uh, fresh uh, and live in many markets in, in Oceania and the Southeast Asia. Uh, the, uh, the main lobster, the North Atlantic lobster, is different. So we won't make the tail, uh, they don't make a tail from it because you, you know, this, is, this, is a, this is a Caribbean lobster, lobster tail. Um, I know that because of its color. Dark or red are usually South Africa or Australia. There's lots of meat in that. So we'll cook that. I'm not going to cook up my pet yet because I want to fatten them up for another week or so. Um, more than likely if you go to Europe and order a lobster, it's from North America. About half of the lobsters in North America are in Europe if you dine there. I don't go there very often, but in case I do, uh, the lobsters come from North America. Uh, they're very hardy. They travel well. Uh, I got it from the store yesterday. He was in a special tank with a certain kind of water, right? You can't use regular tap water. You have to adjust the water. They tend to, they're, they're cannibals. They tend to bite each other and eat each other. So that's why they have the bands on them. Uh, they transport well, two or three days. Uh, they can do two-day air. And of course, they're shipped this time of year. You're going to get them overnight if you want, or two-day air from many lobster companies in the U.S. and in Canada. They even ship them to Europe. So the lobster has that beautiful color. What's going to say about the lobster? I guess that's about, I guess that's about it. Um, it's one and a quarter pounds. They go up to 15 pounds. I've seen them as large as 18 pounds. It's a fallacy that the larger the lobster, the tougher the meat is. The same meat, because uh, you'll get more of it. You'll boil these or you split them open and grill them. So that's the... Uh, the story on uh, the American lobster. 40,000, 50,000 tons are harvested every year in the North Atlantic. So that's the main lobster. I'll put them back in the newspaper. It kind of likes the Boston Globe, I think. It, it feels comfortable when it's wet. I'm going to put them back in there. So if you get them, put them in the local newspaper, he won't mind. A wet newspaper is best. Of course, seaweed is even better, not in water. So I have the bread around. I think the shrimp probably ready by now. No one told me, but I finally remembered, right? If you're a cook, you have to remember these things. They're looking awfully nice. So I'm going to bring them around. So they're nicely broiled. They're tender. See both sides? Has that beautiful, <laughs> that beautiful, that beautiful bouquet, right? Uh, the beautiful bouquet of cooked shrimp. Nothing finer than that. But just get a small plate. Oh, here it is up here. I'll use this plate to put it on. And I made some garlic butter. Nice and easy. Just what did I do? Slice up some garlic thinly. A paring knife. I didn't chop it up. I didn't want it bitter because sometimes if you chop and saute garlic, it gets bitter. So I sliced it and cooked it, or just, you know, until it was translucent in some butter. So there's nice slivers of, of uh, softened, non bitter garlic will go on top. This makes a great, very nice lunch. And it'll be lunch after I finish the course, so we'll be enjoying that. So a little. Um, Melted butter. You can also put olive oil if you like on that. You want to put to give a little smoky flavor. You can put a little smoked paprika as well. Doesn't want to come out. 
little smoked paprika on the top. Gives it a little nicer red color, right? And uh, we'll, we'll keep that warm as well because we want to enjoy that shortly. So, we're going to prepare the lobster now because we want to broil this lobster. In the meantime, I have a skillet ready and I'll get those warm. Just a little heat on both of those skillets because I want to serve this up nice to you today. Put the skillets on low heat to heat a little bit. Lobster tail defrosted. You'll have to cut the lobster tail. Store it back here. Press down. See that? With your knife. We're not cutting all the way through. Just be safe. Just take your time with your sharp knife. Press down. And it snaps and cut halfway through. Let me open that up. And this is beautiful. Remove all that meat out of the shell. We're not going to take it completely out. Why? I know you know why, because you like ordering this sometimes when you go out. We're going to put it back onto the shell. Give myself a clean towel. We're going to spread some of the melted butter on there. We're going to spread some melted butter onto that tail. I'm going to sprinkle, I just have some have pink Himalayan salt, you can use sea salt. I'm going to sprinkle that on the top. I'm going to put that onto my broiler pan. I'm going to put it in my broiler and I'm going to bring it around the side here. Then I'll be right back. So I have some seafood here on the counter. So I want to wash that off. I have a sanitizing bucket uh, with a sanitary liquid, a little bleach water. I think I'll move this to the side right here. And another towel to wipe this clean. All right, so we have our pans heating. Our couscous is done. For all intents and purposes, the couscous is done. And just with a fork, you can see with a fork, we're just loosening up that couscous. It's, it's, a, beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. It's a nice, uh, simple grain to make. I'm going to add uh, some of that, some of that. Slivered toasted almonds, some diced figs, and the whole cranberries. And I might moisten it with a little broth. But couscous, uh, in most cases, uh, in North Africa, it's very, very dry. I prefer a little more moisture in it. So look at that. It's even easier than rice pilaf. Let that sit there by itself. And it's doing good. So I have my shrimp cocktail. That's done. Make a cocktail sauce after. I did my uh, shrimp on brochette with a nice slivered, slowly cooked gar uh, garlic and, and melted butter. That was really great. Make sure I salted the proteins before I cook them and then uh, broil them. Like I said, watch the level of your broiler. It might be um, too high. You want to check it with toast to see. Maybe start low, build up. Especially how, how it depends on how thick that lobster tail or the shrimp are. You can buy the jumbo shrimp U15s, U8s. They're really big. So be mindful of that. So we have two vegetables to do. I want to do a vegetable, uh, the garnish for the asparagus, which I'll do last. And I want to prepare for you the nice Brussels sprouts with a little pancetta and some uh, toasted breadcrumbs. So I have my skillet on. What I did was earlier, I blanched these until they were tender. I took Brussels sprouts, cut them in half, removed the stem, cut them in half. It gives a nice green color. And I cook them until they're, they're al dente. 
it, it's firm, but cooked halfway, halfway through, right? Al dente. So they're firm, but they're cooked. Because I want to saute these up. So simmering water, salted water, and I drain them. Now you can do the green bean route, the string bean route, the snow pea route as well. The same preparation uh, with snow peas. You'd have to blanch them a little bit. Or if you're going to buy the flat, um, there's, there's the snap peas. Sorry, there's the snap peas that are thicker, and there's the snow pea. The snow pea you can easily saute uh, to order for your guests. The uh, snap pea have to blanch first, just a little bit, because otherwise they're quite raw and, and crunchy, unless you like them like that. So have some olive oil in the pan. And let that, let that, you know, sear a little bit. Put my wooden spoon here and give it a stir. I'm going to add a few slivers of garlic as well to that that I sliced in. I'm going to add my uh, Brussels sprouts to that. So I pick all the Brussels sprouts, all the same size, so that they um, will, will uh, cook evenly. Some are large, some are small. Pick all the ones the same size. So there's a little, a little heat in there. I'm going to add some salt. I'm going to add two pinches of salt. A pinch is actually a measurement. It's, let me say, a sixteenth of an inch. It depends yes, if you have a big thumb and a big finger. So a pinch of salt is that. So we're going to do two pinches of salt. So we want to get a little, a little caramelization on that. So I have a little high. I'm going to deglaze a little white wine. I like to use Sauvignon Blanc. When I cook, it's, it's tart. And the Sauvignon Blanc has a little grassy a vegetable, vegetative um, grassy flavor, straw flavor to Sauvignon Blanc. So I like to, to use that. That kind of cuts that cabbage flavor that you'll see in, uh, in Brussels sprouts. But when they're like that, and they're tender and meaty, and they have nice flavor, you're really going to love them. What else do I have? I have some pancetta I cooked earlier. Or you can leave out the pancetta Italian bacon, or just regular bacon, or no bacon. So your choice. And then I have a pinch of, two pinches of thyme, fresh thyme. It really goes nice with the, the Brussels sprouts. Give that a nice toss. Okay, let's put a little pepper in there now. A couple pinches of pepper. Let that brown up. I put the pepper towards the end because it can scorch and burn, especially finely ground. I like to grind up my own every so often. I buy the telecherry peppercorn. A little larger, they're actually bigger. than media, meatier if you need peppercorn could be meaty. But they certainly have a nice, um, a nice uh, a texture to them. So the uh, last thing to add is some, is some uh, toasted breadcrumbs, which is nice to add. This is almost what you would call anglaise, the preparation. Uh, chopped parsley, toasted breadcrumbs, a little butter, salt and pepper. It's, I guess, it's somewhat of an English preparation for Brussels sprouts. I guess only English people could love Brussels sprouts, right? So. Let's uh, heat up this pan. I got a little olive oil. I use extra virgin. Well, the price is right. I don't heat it. I don't sear items in. I use pure or salad oil if I'm going to sear or something. That's looking good already. So I just want to heat up my peppers. I did um, red and yellow peppers. I cut them in julienne, as I mentioned before, and then I um, cut them in brunoise, small dice, small dice. So 
So these are sort of caramelized nicely. See these, the, uh, what's it, asparagus? I see the Brussels sprouts, they get nice and brown. You know, nothing, nothing is better than a crisp saute Brussels sprout. You can boil them in water like cabbage, but it's not a very exciting vegetable, you know. Soft, overcooked Brussels sprouts or, or boiled cabbage. Let's add some of those breadcrumbs on there to like finish it off. I'm going to give it a little hit of white wine. A little shot of stock, a little shot of stock. That'll help evaporate the wine. Give it some moisture. Turn that off. We'll have to taste one just to see. Mm. Wow, are those good? A little more salt. One more toss. Turn that off. Peppers are done. Turn that off. Let's go pick up and take it out of the oven. We'll love our shrimps first. Take our shrimps out. Bring those out. We got our asparagus. Nice and hot, right? Steamy hot. Shrimp in the warming drawer. You know, the saran wrap is more of a pain in the neck, but certainly you can identify what's, what's in them. I'm going to drain out some of that water. But it kept the asparagus nice and hot. I have everything turned off. I'm going to take my lobster tail that we broil very nicely, bring it right here onto my table. Put that lobster tail, Oops, still a bit hot. Brush some butter on it. Put that aside. So, very nice looking. For my asparagus, I want to finish it off with just some sauteed peppers. Get my spoon. For my couscous. Place that right here. And then my Brussels sprouts, I like to put on a separate dish to serve those. I have a warm dish up here. A nice uh, family service, as you can see, family style. So let's review. Nice, crisp, and tender Brussels sprouts, pancetta, and um, with, with pancetta and a little Sauvignon Blanc. We did a, a beautiful broiled question, shrimps. And we have a question coming in. What is the temperature of the warming drawer? Oh, the warming drawer is, the temperature of the warming drawer is 175 degrees. Some have low, some have high. So at least above 145. So depending on what you put in the oven, in the warming drawer, you can put it at 145 if it's very delicate, or if it's going to hold up, 175. So that's the warming drawer temperature. So, ask some questions before we close up for the holiday. You, you know, you must have some more questions out there to ask me. So we did our asparagus. That's stuff. We did our asparagus. White asparagus. Uh, you can put a little melted butter on that if you want to. Or not, a little stock. Uh, you can put salt and pepper to finish off with it. The beautiful uh, shrimp and brochette. Had some smoked paprika, even a nice smoky flavor. There's your beautiful broiled lobster tail that took about, well, I broiled that for about 14 minutes on low heat, all right? So you be mindful of your broiler. And we have a beautiful couscous, couscous uh, pilaf, I guess you'd call it. And I guess uh, the last thing you want to do perhaps is 
is get yourself a very nice um, Myers lemon. They're very beautiful, the Myers lemon. They're very tender. They have a very sweet, very sweet juice. So I'm going to do a nice lemon crown, which is a nice garnish uh, for both the, the lobster and the shrimp. And you can put a little sprinkle of parsley on that, and perhaps a dab of paprika. And pretty much, that's it. Uh, thank you for being here with us at LearnToCook.com. I'm Chef Mark. Look forward to seeing you next time. Um, send us an email, and we'll be happy to answer your cooking questions. So uh, enjoy your winter holiday, winter recess, all the great food days that you may have with your family or dining out. And uh, bon appétit. Bye-bye.